Hello, we got Dr. Reddy back here, back on the show. <laughs> hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming. Oh. Back. How are you? Good, yeah, good to see you again. How you been? How was your wedding? It was great. We had a good time. Great honeymoon in uh, Europe for three weeks. Oh, where did you go? All over 15 countries, no, 15, no, 15 cities, six countries. Congratulations. Yeah. What was your favorite spot? Um, Probably Iceland. I really liked Iceland. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think recommend it. Mm -hmm. It was nice to be back in Italy again, too. Season. Yeah, it's hard to have a bad time in Italy. Yeah, I grew I grew up there in Italy so, for four years. So I got uh -huh. to visit one of my friends. He's actually a, a medical doctor in Italy. And mm -hmm. So it was interesting learning about the Italian system from him. Yeah. Uh, I was like, oh, wow. They don't pay doctors much over there, you know. <laughs> no, they don't. But so did you talk to him at all about the repurposed drugs? Are they into that at all? No, not at all. They're not into hormone replacement therapy at all in Europe. It's uh, they're probably about fifty years behind on that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, they're really just uh, you know basic you know allopathic medicine there, but uh, mm -hmm. you know a functional medicine, integrative medicine is way more advanced here in the U.S. Uh, it is <clears throat> really hmm. not heard of in Italy. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The only other country in the world that I know of that is doing a clinical study of ivermectin in patients with cancer is in Iran. And Iran, the Iranians wrote a really good paper um, on the potential for ivermectin in the treatment of cancer. One of the best papers I've ever read on the subject. Um, and uh, I do know that they've got a study underway so that's the good news. They're really smart, wonderful, very cultured people. Um, unfortunately, they're Iranians. <laughs> so here in the United States and in Europe, they're not likely to get much coverage no. of their data. But no, you'd have to go search through the academic journals to find that stuff. I find that stuff though. I do. do you? Yeah. Oh, good. I find yeah. I was just uh, you know, I've been going down the rabbit hole on iodine, you know, just going yeah, down. Yeah learning yeah. about how critical that is for the treatment and prevention of at least five different cancers, including thyroid, mm -hmm. breast, yeah. ovarian, uterine, and prostate. Yep. And okay. Looking at this right before here, I was just looking at, um, you know, a study out of Turkey and they were looking at, you know, what do you even think about it? Uh, Preeclampsia, maternal hypertension and iodine deficiency. Yeah. Now we always were taught it's magnesium deficiency. And yes, magnesium is still the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, iodine plays a big role in that too. Who would have known? Little things mm -hmm. like that. And you can kind of sometimes find that in little, you know, country. And Turkey isn't a little country, but you can find that in, you know, non like Western journals and so forth. So, what is the mechanism of action by which iodine helps to prevent cancer or treat cancer? Yeah. So, I can pull that up here. Uh -huh. It was. Um, Magnesium assimilation is known to be defective when iodine levels are insufficient. In mm. Northeast Anatolia, where iodine deficiency is common, clinical trials of iodine supplementation um, should be considered for preeclamptic therapy. Mm -hmm. Something I came across there. Um, you know, in my patient population, I've identified that iodine deficiency is rampant as well. Let me share this uh, screen with you here. I just went through my uh, database and I've tested 30 patients for serum iodine levels. And, um, you know, the lab core reference range is 40 to 100 out of mm -hmm. the 30 that I've tested. The average is about 44. They're, they're way on the bottom of the reference range. So it's not like it's an outlier iodine deficiency. It is the norm. Not a mm -hmm. single patient has high or optimized iodine levels if they're not actively taking iodine. Like here's my level with taking three drops lugals every day. I was at 180. This mm -hmm. patient, I told him to take iodine. His level shot up to 255. Okay. You can get it up high in the serum. It's not mm -hmm. like the serum isn't detecting it. It's just everyone's deficient. 
like as a rule. Mm. It's crazy. So in, in terms of preventing or treating cancer, where does iodine play a role? Yeah. So the breast tissues in women require a lot more iodine, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So fibrocystic breast disease, uh-huh. cystic disease, hardening of the breast. This is oh. an iodine deficiency. Wow. And okay. Lots of studies, clinical human studies, there's rat studies too, but human studies giving women iodine and iodide both mm-hmm. and softening of the breast improvement. Mm-hmm pain in the breast tissue. And we know this change in the arc and the structure mm-hmm. uh, of the breast tissue increases mm-hmm. the risk of that, uh, that cancer down the road. Right. Yeah, something so simple, right? Interesting. Huh? Well, we know the breasts are metabolically very dynamic, very active. Yeah. You know, they don't look like they're doing much, but they are. Uh, and they're constantly responsive to various uh, inputs uh, and levels of the female sex hormone. So mm-hmm. I wonder if iodine plays a role in terms of the metabolic thermostat, you yeah. know, uh, it, of, it of the control, environment of breast. It controls estrogen metabolism as well is what iodine does. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And, and very some interesting. studies in, in, in cancer, in breast cancer patients on like tamoxifen therapy, Mm-hmm. Uh, the iodine actually made the medication work a little bit better as well. Do you add iodine to a general protocol for a patient with cancer? Uh, I am now, you know, I'm just going down this rabbit hole here and it's, I'm, I just talked to Manuel of the prostate community trials. Yeah. Like we got to put this into our protocols for prostate yeah. too. Yeah. The yeah. prostate is an iodine sensitive organ too. We need to be yeah. figuring out uh, you know, all these patients need to be on. It's cheap too, right? You know, his, his study is mostly in the Philippines with indigent yeah. people. I yeah. cheap. Yeah. Right. Well, um, turning back the hands of time, when I was doing my fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I was looking at obviously a lot of data. And uh, one of the things that I sort of bumped into was a comparison of the epidemiologic uh, profiles of breast cancer and prostate cancer, and they were identical. And I was like, so I knew the the fellow um, on who was doing the urology, you know, fellowship there. And I said, let's go out for pizza, honey. Okay, we got to talk about this. I said, I think that breast cancer and prostate cancer are the same disease, yeah. expressed differently in yeah. men and women. Yes. And then later on, when I became aware of and focused the majority of my interest on the question of the breast cancer virus, <clears throat> which targets breast tissue, um, I also discovered that it's passed in seminal fluid as well, um, and that it's down there in male genitalia. And I thought, well, that would explain the relationship between prostate cancer and breast cancer being so similar, both being target organs for this cancer virus. Really? Mm -hmm. And then they're also iodine sensitive organs, both of those two. Right. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, really. It's just, you know, um, when we were kids, I I really enjoyed the the sort of, uh, you know, laptop, challenge of connecting the dots you know <laughs> i still enjoy that i'm like here's a dot here's a dot you know are they related and, and see you know what you find in in the picture mm-hmm. yeah thank you so much here so bring us up to date with your um ivermectin experience cancer experience yeah um yeah i can't say i've used it too much in patients with cancer because i don't have that patient population i know you have more of that i've had more like the large prostate Mm -hmm. population and what i've found is that it seems to help the symptoms of the the frequent urination and so forth and we've seen it drastically reduce psa levels in some patients but i don't feel like it's the solution because the moment they go off of it the symptoms of urgency comes back which Um, that has partially led me down the iodine rabbit hole is trying wow. to find another solution for these people. How fast does it come back? Um, 
But within about a day or two. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Very fast. So it's, you know, it's like an allopathic medical treatment. I'm not a fan of those, you know, taking a pill every day to try to yeah. you know, suppress something. And I feel like that's kind of the road I was going down with ivermectin for that. Well, it's odd. And that that's actually, you know, when you find something that's odd, you have to stick with it because that's where the jackpot is. So it's odd that ivermectin, which is known to inhibit both benign and malignant tumor growth would show such a quick rebound yeah. in terms of symptoms yeah. following cessation, like within a day or two. I was hoping for a longer lasting effect. Yeah, right. I didn't see that. What's up with that? No idea. Well, that we have to put a post-it on that. It might be its anti-inflammatory properties. You're just getting some relief from that. A bit of, um, well, I wonder if there's also um, some vasodilatory. There is um, always that. The guys would start getting erections again. That's what they would start talking to me. Oh, about. really? Is that right? Yeah, erections. Yeah. Start coming back. Ivermectin. Yeah, with ivermectin of all things. Well, holy cow. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a whole new subject to explore, which is the, you know, vasodilatory or, you know, vasoactive component of ivermectin. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Really fascinating. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Okay. In, my, in the next century, if I have time, we can circle back to it or somebody else can. That's true. Hmm. What, what have you found uh, in your continuation with this trial with ivermectin for cancer? Right. So it's actually a study. It's not a trial. Just to let the viewers know, I know you know the difference, but for the viewers to know, um, a, a trial is actually where you have some intervention that you want to test based on a hypothesis that it will have an impact against a non or at the absence of the intervention. So you have a control trial, the control arm of the study. You'll have people who get placebo. Um, and so forth. So this is a pure observational study. So think of it this way. Um, I'm like, I've got a clipboard, I'm standing at an intersection and I'm just taking the data. Like how many cars are there? What kind of cars? How fast are they going? Do they stop at the red light? Time of day, weather, whatever, okay? I'm just collecting the data. That's an observational study. You can collect a great deal of data from an observational study without impacting it and out there, you know, directing traffic or whatever, but you can collect a lot of information. And then when you see what we call a signal, um, a statistical signal, that is you see a correlation, you know, all blue cars run the red lights. What does that have to do? You know, is there a relationship between blue cars and red lights? No. Um, so when you begin to see a signal, then you can turn that correlation over to other researchers so that they can look to see if there is a causal relationship to the correlation. Um, and if they can't quick find one, they can look for it. Just like you and I were talking about, you know, increase frequency of erections after you're taking ivermectin. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's a signal. <laughs> okay. We have to turn that over to the researchers to figure out what's going on there. So in this observational study, I'm just collecting data on patients who have decided to take ivermectin and other basically anti-parasitic repurposed FDA approved medication. They've decided to do this. They have um, access to these medications either through their primary care physicians or other physicians. Um, and they come into <clears throat> the study so that I can collect the data. The, the point is to determine whether or not patients who are taking ivermectin and who have cancer have an improved survival compared to historical data because we've got 50 years of historical data. So I'll tell you about the first patient. I think I mentioned it before, but I can give you an update. So the first patient, <clears throat> Paul, um, 53 years old, and uh, he very healthy, marathoner, uh, no family history of anything really. 
the men in the family died in old age of cardiovascular disease, but otherwise fine and healthy. And um, works with the government. Um, he had to be vaccinated or risk losing his job. So he received two Pfizer vaccines, I guess one month apart. Two months after his second Pfizer shot, he developed severe back pain and was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. Um, he immediately went into a very conventional therapy. So radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and then more radiation therapy for additional bone mats, um, some monoclonal therapy. His uh, PSA, I believe initially was in the 700s, in the sky high. Um, and it was determined that his prostate cancer was hormone resistant. So it was castration resistant, but they gave him castrating medications anyway. And um, they put him on Zalota finally. And then, so it was a year ago, just about a year ago, um, he was progressing. And at this point, the cancer was in 11 different bones, ribs, arms, legs, everything. His right leg was swollen because it was obstructed with tumor. He was absolutely miserable. He was down to about what he would describe as like 15% of his formal, former vitality. And uh, his uh, physician said, there really isn't anything else we can do for you. We can offer you hospice, but there are no clinical trials and we're out of options. And um, so obviously he was still in a state, state of shock because he wasn't very far into this cancer experience um, and very disheartened as you can imagine, particularly regretting the possibility that he had traded off a job for his life if the vaccines were implicated in causing the cancer. Um, a friend of his uh, was an acquaintance of mine and she said, would I be willing just to talk to him and provide kind of emotional support? And I said, sure, of course. So I, I began calling him we talked regularly, um, and I think that was in December of last year. And then about in January, I had begun in the process of prescribing ivermectin for patients with COVID. I began to look at ivermectin and the history of it and discovered all of 20 years of research <laughs> that it had great potential as an anti-cancer agent. I was like, you're kidding me. Um, very intriguing. And then I knew, of course, it, it would not reach clinical studies here in the United States or anywhere, probably, because there was no money to be made. And if the drug companies aren't going to fund it, no one's going to fund it. End of discussion. So um, finally, I said, look, Paul, I said, I don't know whether this would help at all, but I'm pretty confident it's not going to hurt you because patients who were dying in the intensive care unit from COVID were given ivermectin. They did fine. So it's not likely that ivermectin is going to hurt you. And I don't know, it might help. Um, maybe give that some thought. Well, he thought about it for about a minute. And then he jumped in the car. He lives in Missouri and he drove to Tennessee where you can get ivermectin over the counter. So he started taking ivermectin at body weight dosing. And I continued to talk to him once a week and he was getting a little bit better. The swelling wasn't as bad in the leg. The pain was a little bit, it was very slow going, but it was just a little bit better. Um, he went to his next follow-up appointment, which was about two months later, and his PSA was less than one. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was very surprised. He was thrilled. I was like, whoa. Um, so he continued. And uh, we talked about, um, some of the other things that he could take if he chose to take them, um, melatonin, metformin, the fasting mimicking diet, which I have done myself on 12 occasions, I'm a big fan of that. Um, and so he, he said, yep, yeah, you know, he would talk to his doctor, he would get those things fine, good. 
Um, okay, so let's fast forward. Very slow progress. Uh, an, an immediate onset, I think, of making a difference, but slow travel through the universe here. Um, much less pain after a while. The leg swelling went away. Uh, he began to be able to walk again, get around. His appetite was good. Um, then he had a follow-up complete head-to-toe scan in September of this year. Okay. Three of the bone mets had resolved completely. Um, there were no new lesions. Everything else looked stable. There was only really one hot spot, as it were, and that was the original site in the sacrum that they had irradiated and really tried to blast it to, to the moon and beyond. And the radiologist could not distinguish whether that was metabolically active tumor site or whether that was post-radiation changes. There's no way to distinguish between the two. Meanwhile, Paul <laughs> goes out and dances for four hours, three nights a week now, and feels like he's about 85% back to his norm, what was his precancer vitality. So in that case, ivermectin seems to be doing a job, seems to be beneficial because there's nothing else on the table um, in a very slow but demonstrable way. Because he's taking Zelota to protect his bones from any metastatic catastrophe, he's not a candidate for mebendazole. They're contraindicated. I don't know that he would consider adding mebendazole now to try and nudge things along at a faster rate. It's something to consider, but he would have to come off the, the Zelota. And often patients are afraid to come off a drug they think is helping them to yeah. see if something else would help. So as long as he's making progress, and obviously if he's, if he's dancing for four hours, three nights a week, he's pretty good. So that's the update on that patient. Um, there have been, there's another patient um, who came into the study desperately ill. Um, you know, I think when I said, I thought it would be a good idea to do an observational study, I have a feeling that God was like laughing and saying, okay, <laughs> let me send you some patients that will challenge you <laughs> in that decision. Very, very challenging cases have come my way. This is a, another relatively young man in his 50s um, who was diagnosed with a colon cancer and it came on, you know, like a supersonic missile. Mm -hmm. Supersonic missiles travel at 7,600 miles an hour, okay? Let's hope Putin doesn't fire one of those because you know, right. you'll, be, you'll be gone before you know it was launched. So he thought he had some abdominal pain. Um, he thought he had, might have a hernia. This is so typical. Goes to the emergency room, gets worked up. He's got stage four um, cancer that they identify as beginning in the appendix. And it's just ripping him apart. It's everywhere. It's in his liver. It's small bowel obstruction. Awful. Um, he's got a feeding tube a nasogastric tube. Um, he can't really eat. He could take some liquids, you know, through the feeding tube, but not a lot. Um, and this was the story. He was so desperately ill that in and, and so much pain that he would be admitted to the hospital for intractable pain, um, like having an animal gnaw your gut. Mm. And they would put him on, you know, intravenous narcotics, which would, of course, paralyze the bowel, relieve the pain. It would take about three days for him to be totally zombied out with less pain. They would send him home. He'd come off the narcotics, could not get enough of a blood level with oral narcotics, 
um, and go back into excruciating pain three days later, back in the hospital. So this was it, every three days, in and out of the hospital on narcotics. So he actually is a dentist who has horses out somewhere in the Midwest. I see where this is going. Okay, so he was putting ivermectin paste on himself. And uh, that really wasn't working. Um, So I talked to him uh, about the benefits of trying orally, but doing it in such a way that you were giving small doses over a longer, you know, period of time instead of all at once, maybe over an hour to get the blood level. Um, And that seemed to help was feeling better, but it wasn't keeping him out of the hospital. So there's still the intractable pain. So the ivermectin seemed to, and I think they scanned him again. There was no progression of disease, uh, but there was no improvement in terms of symptoms. Mm. Um, and he certainly is not going to be able to live like this every three days in and out on morphine no. drills. No, no, there's no way to live. So, um, We talked about Mibendazole and he decided, yeah, he wanted to try Mibendazole. So he was able to get the Mibendazole. P.S. This was when I learned about the melodrama around Mibendazole. And I think this is why people are taking Fenbendazole. It's expensive. Do you have any any idea how much it costs? Yeah, it costs $500 a pill. $650 a pill. Yes. $650 a pill and you need two a day ridiculous yeah so um i guess you can get fenbendazole for pennies oh, shit, yeah. i think that's why people are, are taking fenbendazole the problem is that fenbendazole is a powder toxic and it's not been studied in humans i'm gonna plant the flag on this hill don't take fenbendazole have you have you looked at have you ran liver function studies in patients taking fenben um I haven't because none of the patients that I follow are taking fenbendazole. Um, ethically, now I'm not saying that people, other people can't do it. It's a free rule. You know, come on. Here's the United States, you know? I've run them multiple times. Like I was, I'm like, all right, whatever. You know, my patients are going to buy it online and take it. I'm like, let's yeah. at least run the liver uh, panel. I've seen no problems in LFTs with fenbendazole. Great. Well, I did not want to have in the study that I'm conducting, uh, patients who were not taking FDA approved medications, because I felt like my objective is to see if there's a signal, is there improvement, and to present the data, present these data. And if we're gonna move the needle in orthodox medicine, and hopefully we are, I wanted to minimize any vulnerabilities when people go to scrutinize the data. And having patients that are on fenbendazole would certainly cast a long shadow on the rest of the data. They would just say, boom, that's it. You know, bullseye, you're out. So the, the task, the goal became find mebendazole, FDA approved, and for which you still have to monitor liver function studies at a decent price, not $650 a pill. And oh, P.S., it occurred to me that... Ivermectin at about 10 cents a pill, the cost goes for about maybe $3 a pill at an expensive private pharmacy here in the United States. Yeah. Mibendazole, about as cheap, goes for $650 a pill. And I began to wonder did they slap a price tag of $650 a pill on the bendazole because it's that effective? And Mom. they don't want, and they don't want anybody. Okay. It's could, a possibility. Could it very well be. <laughs> it's a possibility. So I set it out in all points bulletin to um, the network, shall we say, the Underground Railroad. And I said, we have to source Mabendazole at a reasonable price. And sure enough, we had people who showed up and said, yep, we've sourced it. It's reliable, 56 cents a pill. So once we knew that reliable mebendazole could be purchased at a reasonable price. You um, get it, uh, in India or were you getting it? it? Yeah, it comes from India. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we had to make sure that we weren't getting, you know, schnookered. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so the poor guy with carcinomatosis and malignant ascites and small bowel obstruction every which way um, started taking mebendazole in addition to the ivermectin. Mm -hmm. And he's not been back in the hospital since for pain. And he's able to eat and his small bowel obstruction has resolved and he's passing gas and he's passing stool. Um, His biggest problem now is that he was well enough to begin chemotherapy and (laughs) now now he's sick as a dog with chemotherapy and we're trying to muscle our way through um, adjuvants to help him get through the chemotherapy. There's some data in the literature that um, ivermectin uh, and even mebendazole can be synergistic with some of the chemotherapeutic agents. Um, so it may be that they're working together. Who knows? But he's better. And he got better when he started the mebendazole. He might have been better. He might have been stabilized with the ivermectin. But the addition of mebendazole appears in an anecdotal way to have made a difference. And now it's been, I'm going to say a month been a month since he needed hospital admission and now he's just struggling with the chemotherapy um there was another patient with um, stage four colon cancer um ascites hepatic mats miserable pain awful uh he's one of these big farmer type trucker guys you know and um he started taking ivermectin And within about, I think five days, four or five days, he felt well enough to go bale hay, a thousand bales of hay, what he was doing one weekend. I was like, okay, you must be feeling better. (laughs) You know, even a healthy person would have trouble keeping up with him. The end point for the study is to see whether or not there's a survival benefit. Whether these patients, regardless of how they're feeling otherwise, or the extent of disease, the end point really is survival. Are these people living longer than historical controls? Um, And it's too soon to say, but the indication suggests that the answer is yes. The longer the study continues, it's a two-year study, but the longer we get into it and the more people who are enrolled in the study, the more likely we will know whether we're really onto something clinically with regard to ivermectin. And if in this strictly observational study, if we see that there's a signal here, the people taking ivermectin and other repurposed drugs are living longer than historical controls, then we will be on firm footing to both present the data to a scientific community and have it be scrutinized and chewed up every which way, which is good. You want all kinds of constructive criticism, but we'll be able then to launch the trials where now you're actually developing a protocol. Ivermectin alone, ivermectin plus mevendazole, what's the dosing, what's the duration? adding iodine, adding melatonin, adding metformin, all the permutations that you can think of around the observation that ivermectin improves the survival of patients with cancer. Excellent. Good stuff. I love it. It's good, but I have to tell you, man, um, it's challenging. It is. It's enormously challenging. For everyone, it's challenging for the patients because they've come to the end of the bitter end of the rope. Yeah. Right. Um, they're usually out of options. I had a patient, oh, this is terrible. This is a terrible story. Last night, a brother of a patient calls me. And you could tell at the sound of his voice, he's heartbroken. Heartbroken. He's basically sitting at his brother's deathbed brother with four vaccines in him was diagnosed with cancer in September. And apparently I didn't get the whole story, but he presented with 
you know, kind of a turbo presentation, right? Supersonic cancer. So much so that the doctor said to him, you've got cancer, we assume it's in his belly somewhere. Um, and there's no point in diagnosing exactly where this cancer is coming from. There's nothing we can do. So <laughs> here's a guy desperately ill. The doctor doesn't even want to go to the trouble of diagnosing the primary tumor, says there's nothing we can do. Goodbye. So his this is now six weeks ago. So his brother uh, calls me. I guess he just hears about the study. And he wants to know, is there anything that can be done? I said, well, can he eat? Yeah. Yeah, he can eat. He can eat. Okay. Well, um, but he's ashen and he's lost weight and he's in a lot of pain. I was like, well, if he can eat, we could get ivermectin in him if that's what he would choose to do. I, but it's this sounds like, you know, the final moments of the end of a sad story here. He said, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll I'll talk to I'll talk to him. I'll talk to the family. So he he uh, texts me back and he goes, I discussed the family, you know, the question of giving him ivermectin, and they said, oh, that's the worst paste. That's terrible. They all watch CNN. <laughs> so no. So yeah. So it, it I can imagine it would be unlikely that ivermectin would have um, had an impact in that case because it was so so much the end of the story. But it's heartbreaking for the patient, especially if the doctor doesn't even want to bother to identify the primary, for God's sake. Um, I can understand that nothing could be done, but really, you owe it to the patient to say it's stomach cancer, it's colon cancer, whatever it is. So the patient is crushed, the family is crushed, and then they find me, many of them, uh, and it's quite the challenge i can tell you to figure out exactly what the big picture is for the patient um educate the patient about what the options are get them to understand that they have a choice to make if they want to try it that participating in the study is just my with me and my clipboard okay collecting the data working with their doctors if that's what they choose to do um, wow, I, I can't imagine thinking 10 years ago that I was coming to the end of my wonderful career as a cancer surgeon, that I would be now on the end of my seat every time the phone rings, you know, very challenging. This is exciting times for, for you. This is fun. Well, for everyone. It's exciting for everyone because I feel in some ways, this gives us an opportunity to resurrect the medical profession. The medical profession was torpedoed by the healthcare system. Guys with MBAs saw that there was plenty of money to be made by designing a healthcare system that was profit driven, algorithm driven, um, well marketed, and that usurped medical decision making professional medical decision-making and the physician, the practices were bought up, the physicians were turned into employees and everything became the division of motor vehicles in terms of its mentality. Now with the onset of COVID brave and intelligent and capable and honorable physicians and surgeons and allied healthcare professionals like yourself have been able to exercise their professional judgment and do so at great cost in some cases. But here, COVID, ivermectin, repurposing antiparasitic medications, I believe is a threshold through which we can pass into a resurrected medical profession where we're asking the right questions, challenging each other, tell me what you you think you tell me about iodine i'll tell you about menbendazole you know yeah, Argu fun. arguing it out looking at the data taking care of the patients doing our best and letting the patients make decisions yeah i love it it makes it so much more fun 
very gratifying. The intellectual curiosity is there again. Yeah. Yes, it is. And the, and the level of responsibility has gone way up. It's not very difficult to be employed as a physician and follow a screen and algorithms. How difficult is that? It, it's so easy. I mean, I sat down at a dinner this uh, Wednesday by a local mm -hmm. hospital organization. We had these, we got a nice steak dinner and wine. We got these two surgeons up there, uh, breast cancer surgeons, just telling us about, you know, how to prevent breast cancer. But what their prevention is, is like mammogram. Uh, and then come see us and we're going to surgically excise this thing. And I asked them, I was like, you know, what do you, what's, um, what's your thoughts on the uh, relationship between iodine deficiency and uh, breast masses, cysts, and cancers? And they're like, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? What's the evidence behind that? I'm like, there's a lot of evidence. It's, a, it's in the research journals. They're like, oh, no, I, we don't know anything about that. So, you know, it's all very protocol driven and there doesn't seem to be a lot of intellectual curiosity about trying, trying to find the root cause of it. You know, their idea of prevention is just, you know, mammogram and cut. That's that's it. Yeah, very simple. Well, a mammogram never prevented one cancer. Mammograms do not prevent cancer. OK, iodine, selenium, low, you know, whatever exercise, those prevent breast cancer mammograms. Taking pictures does not prevent cancer. As a matter of fact, an argument was made by, who was it, Walsh or Welch? Um, Gary Walsh? At Brown, at Brown University. I actually argued with him on Huffington Post about the paper that he published, but it was actually a very good paper. Um, and the, the bottom line is that you would have to find, well, I don't know, a large number of cancers on a mammogram to prevent one death from breast cancer. So you have to do all these biopsies, all these diagnoses of cancer that's never gonna bother you. One third, one third of the cancers that are found based on mammogram screening would never have bothered the patient at all if they had never been found. Yeah. One third. Now I argued with him, I said, okay, that's fine. I accept your data. I think that's probably very true. Can you tell me who those one third are? Because there are one third, you're talking about a million women right now who are wondering, well, three million women now in this country who are wondering whether their cancer was overdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. If you can't tell a cancer that's going to kill you from a cancer that's not going to kill you, and mammogram is the only screening method you have. Well, you don't give up the only screening method you have. What you have to do is refine the difference between a cancer that's going to kill you and one that you can walk away from. Okay. But mammograms don't prevent cancer. So stop that nonsense. I know. And they were like, what really blew my mind was like, they're, oh, they're showing us pictures of these mammograms of fibrocystic breast. And they're like, oh, look, you can't see the cancer in this fibrocystic breast. I was okay. thinking the whole time the treatment, the evidence based treatment for fibrocystic breast is iodine, high, high doses of iodine. And it rapidly improves the fibrocystic breast. Even then, your mammogram could work even better. But that was far from their thought process. So that's not medicine. That's algorithms. Okay? Yeah. That's why AI is so popular, because AI can replace people who don't think. Right? It's going to. It can replace the human brain that's not thinking. Patients who have cancer need physicians, surgeons, and allied healthcare professionals who can think yeah. and are willing to think and think and think hard and talk to each other and be challenged. There's no challenge in an algorithm. I mean, it's going to replace a lot of our peers. Uh, they don't see it coming, but it's coming down the pipe. And those MBAs are going to replace them all with robots. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, think, I think the healthcare system's coming down. I tell you, the main reason the healthcare system is coming down is because the currency is getting ready to collapse and they're going to close the banks. And they're not going to be able to pay any. And so patients will actually be looking for people like ourselves who are generally, genuinely committed to the practice and the profession and will think through with the patient what makes sense for the patient. So I get a lot of calls. 
what's your protocol? Nobody has a protocol. I have a protocol. <laughs> See me in two years or maybe a year if we close the study because we have such a big signal, you know? We'll get to a protocol. Nobody has a protocol yet. People go to TikTok, they go to YouTube, you know, they go to websites where, you know, I'm not a doctor, but here's what I'm what you should do. Hmm. Think through every single patient. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I referred one for uh, to you the other day. I came across him uh, quite randomly. And mm-hmm. he started uh, taking fenbendazole on his own. Uh, yeah. Would you would you start enrolling any of those in your study? Are you just kind of observing what they're doing. Well, the study has is a two part study. The first piece is a is a consultation. Yeah. The first, the patient um, who's interested in becoming part of the study has to go through an initial consultation, a review of the entire medical record, so that I can see the big picture understand where the patient is coming from, what his or her preferences are. Some people want to continue with the therapy in addition to the other stuff. Some people can't do this any longer. They don't want to do it at all. They want to do this. So it's a whole range. But the first, you begin with a consultation. If a patient, and and I've had patients come to me um, who want to enroll in the study and they're taking fenbendazole, I don't tell anybody what to do. I'm not providing medical advice. I'm not a provider. I'm not a consultant, whatever. But I can share with them the information that there are hazards to fenbendazole that we don't know about because it's not been tested in humans. We do know of one case study where a woman went into hepatic failure taking it. Um, But like these people, they really believe in fenbendazole. So I think it'd be perfect if you know, you could observe them and they're going to have those records. They're going to have the, the scans and they're going to have the liver function tests. I mean, you could observe this. Well, I could, but ethically, this is where, it, you know, my ethics, my medical professional ethics comes into play, um, both for the study and for myself. I can say to them, if you're taking fenbendazole because it's accessible and it's cheap, you can now take mebendazole, same category. They're, they're cousins, they're maybe brothers and sisters yeah. for, for the same price. Right. So you don't, you don't need to take the veterinary formulation. You can take the human formulation and you can get it for cheap. Okay. So that would be the conversation. And every single person like that who's come into the study has said, oh, sure. Okay. If I can get it for cheap, and it's the equivalent basic structure belongs to the same group as fenbendazole. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll go with mebendazole. So they do. So that's the initial consultation. And then if they want to be part of the long-term study, then it's going to be, yeah, okay. So they're doing mebendazole. Oh, that's great. Okay. So you'll be looking at both mebendazole and ivermectin then. Yeah. And, but there's interesting, you know, I'm like so into the world's literature, which goes back decades now. There are other antiparasitics that show great potential. Nitazoxanide, piperazine, um, niclosamide, I believe. So I'm I'm just beginning to look into these other antiparasitics um, because they work in in a little bit different ways. So let me just pause and let's go back to the history of chemotherapy. In the beginning, there was darkness and there was Sydney Farber up in Boston. And there were children dying very quickly of leukemia. There's nothing you could do. President Bush, first President Bush lost a perfectly beautiful glamor girl child to leukemia, horrible situation. And Farber began using chemotherapy in patients with childhood leukemia, and he got astonishing good results. They went into remission, some were being cured. It was just like happy days. Well, the next question was, why don't we use this on solid tumors? Now remember, a leukemia is typically a clonal wild expansion of basically a single cell that just multiplies like crazy completely fills the bone marrow and the circulatory system. But if you can kill one cell, you can kill them all. 
And so he did. Solid tumors are communities of multiple heterogeneous clones of cancer. And the single agent therapy that works so well with childhood leukemia failed with solid tumors. And, you know, it's like, what? This is like you and I asking at the beginning, what's this with erections and ivermectin, okay? They were like, what's, what's, why is it cure leukemia and not solid tumors? And then they went back to study the solid tumor. And it was James Holland, who was at Mount Sinai at the time, professor of virology and oncology. And he said, you know, solid tumors are a heterogeneous community of different clones. And they emerge and they become adaptive and resistant and so on and so forth. Let's use combination chemotherapy. Let's use drugs that kill the cancer, but kill them in, in different ways. And then we'll give it every two weeks or every three weeks, we'll kill a bunch of tumor cells and let the new ones grow and kill them and let the new ones grow and kill them three months, four months until we've killed them all, okay? And that began to work beautifully. So then the next challenge was, what's the best combination of drugs? You know, two or three, what's the best combination? And that's where we are today. What's the best combination of drugs? What's the duration? So as I'm beginning to think about ivermectin, mebendazole, and then these other antiparasitics and studying the variations in how they kill parasites, I begin to think back to the lessons that we learned from Sidney Farber and James Holland and all the rest of them, which is it's probably a good idea to go at these solid tumors, particularly the advanced ones that have multiple clones with multiple different antiparasitic agents. Then yeah. the question will be, what's the right recipe? Mm -hmm. In my very brief, narrow, young and naive observation right now, it looks like ivermectin has multiple ways of getting at cancer, but it looks to me as if ivermectin stops the growth of the cancer and then slowly, slowly, slowly kills it. Yeah. Um, that's what it looks like right now. I need many more cases to see if that's actually true. Adding the mebendazole seems to be the equivalent of this multiple drug cocktail where now you go at it with something else. So now I'm beginning to explore the whole world of antiparasitic medications because each of them, they have some things in common. So there's a Venn diagram where they, they have a lot of commonality in killing the tumor um, or stopping the growth, stopping metastasis, stopping uh, blood vessel formation, changing the microenvironment, improving the immune response. I mean, it's just amazing. But a couple of them working together make it less likely that the tumor will be able to escape. Mm -hmm. um, the other big, the, the two other big picture um, things I'm seeing as it were, I'm beginning to appreciate. One, ask yourself the question, in what way is cancer like a parasite? Uh, it, um, it feeds on energy within the body. I think that question opens up a whole new panorama of understanding cancer. In what way are cancer cells and parasites similar? I can't answer that question right now, but it's where I'm going because I, I think there might be something there to explore. Right now, our idea is we have to kill the cancer. We have to kill it. We have to go in there and stab it in the eye, okay? Shoot it in the heart. It might very well be that all we have to do is prevent it from growing mm -hmm. and then it has no reason to exist and it dies. Correct. Well, that's yeah. how you prevent uh, the breast cancer from forming. The reason the breast cancer forms is because of iodine deficiencies. So the breasts turn, uh, they change their morphology. They become hard, they become dense, they get cystic growth. The same thing happens in the thyroid. 
So you get these weird growths that will happen in the body in response to uh, a low iodine status. I mean, the parasites will grow too. I guess, you know, if it's feeding on your blood, it's going to engorge and so forth. I don't know if that's really the same description because it's not like it's a lack of something if you have a parasite. So it might be a little bit different. I'm, I think there it, there are going to be differences, but I think it, it's kind of a meditative question. It's a kind of a question that you would, you know, ask yourself before you go to sleep or before you go on a long walk or something. Is what can I understand about the similarities between cancer, which is clearly an autoparasite and a parasite? Why would antiparasitic drugs work so well against parasites and equally well against cancer, maybe even better against cancer? What can that tell us about the similarities in cancer? It, it's, I just think it's an area to explore. The other uh, impression that I'm getting is that it may not be necessary to kill the cancer. It may be sufficient to prevent it from growing, in which case you basically pull the plug and now it's got nothing to do. If it's not growing, it has nothing to do. Goodbye. Because it's not differentiated. It's not like it's out there doing some good for, for the, you know, the body in its entirety. Pull the plug. It's not growing. It dies. And so here's what's interesting. I have a patient in this study, a seven-year-old. I think I mentioned to you with the Ewing sarcoma. Mm -hmm. Did I tell you that decision, right? Um, Ewing sarcoma of the posterior nasopharynx. What an ugly tumor. Yeah. Anyway, um, on ivermectin, the parents added mebendazole. And oh, by the way, when the parents decided to add mebendazole because the ivermectin seemed to slow the growth of the tumor, but then when they added the mebendazole, the tumor stopped growing entirely. And this patient had been through two rounds of radiation, three different protocols of chemotherapy, and was now uh, it you know recommended to hospice and a morphine drip. Um, so there were a lot of things to finesse in trying to optimize how to take care of both this child and get rid of this tumor because it was really, it was causing a mess in this child's head, nose, ears, eyes, the whole thing. And then about, I'm going to say about a week after starting the mebendazole, um, this child started to spit out pieces of looked like meat. And so the mother was sending me screenshots, you know, like, what, what's this? You know, what's this? And, and she said, it's like, it looks like a piece of bacon. Blah, blah. And I was like, I think he's spitting out tumor. I think, the, I think the tumor is dying and hmm. it's just, it's, it's like calving like icebergs, you know, the pictures of the icebergs when they calve, you know, I, th I think, I think the tumor is calving. I think that's what this is. Um, so I said, next time he does that, send that to, you know, if he's in the hospital, um, getting another round of chemo, which nobody thinks is going to work, but whatever. And he spits that out, send it to pathology. So they did, but they sent it for a CNS and it came back. Well, there was some fungus there. And I was like, I want histology. Okay. <laughs> I'm a surgeon. <laughs> I want histology. Histology, yeah. Uh, and so one of the doctors said, well, what difference would it make? And I'm like, the tumor has stopped growing. He's spitting out tumor. I would like to know. That's just me. I'm curious. I'd like to know. Um, so finally he spit out another piece and it's, they finally agreed. The pathologist finally agreed to do H and E staining and to stain it for the muscle uh, stains for Ewing sarcoma, how they made the diagnosis to begin with. I like, is there muscle tissue there, you know, um, muscle protein there? And, and is it Ewing sarcoma? Does it stain positive for, for muscle? And if so, he's spitting out tumor, um, which I actually think is a good sign. Um, 
Yeah. All in a day's work. <laughs> All in a day's work. Cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, hopefully you'll attend. My, I'm gonna. I plan on giving a big lecture to either Halasa's group or Clearfield's group, yeah. or both on iodine within the coming week. So I'll send you a link to that and uh, got yeah. a big presentation for everyone on that. You know what, um, Stefan? I'm going to point you in the direction of the human mammary tumor virus. Mm -hmm. um, take a look at that. I know that selenium interferes. Um, it blocks replication of the human memory tumor virus. I will look when I get a chance, but right now I'm up to here with anti-parasitic agents. Yes. Yes. Um, but I have a hypothesis because I spent 20 years following the research on the breast cancer virus. Um, and my hypothesis is that iodine interferes with the replication. Right, it's antiviral. Yeah. And that an iodine deficiency then allows the breast cancer virus to begin to do its damage until, so you can get scarring, you know, fibrosis in the breast until you get a tumor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, um, I, I take selenium on a regular basis um, to prevent breast cancer virus activation. Um, and I forget why I started taking iodine. <laughs> It was so long ago, but I'm glad I do. I take it on a regular basis. Good. So, you have to. You have to. Otherwise, you're deficient. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Right. Well, we'll we'll talk soon, and uh, probably see maybe uh, in two weeks when I'm giving some of these presentations. Hopefully, you'll you'll join us there. I'll be happy to. Let me know. I shall. I'll send you the link. That was fun. We'll do this again. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. Have a great weekend.